Hello, I'm Dr. Elaine Fagner, and I am the instructor for this physical geology course. A little bit about geology, physical geology, and what you're facing this semester. It's okay if you signed up for this course just because you needed a science credit, a core transfer course. I'm all right with that. Some of you will go on to be science majors. Many of you will not. You'll choose a profession that involves your strengths. And I want to support that, but I'm going to tell you that I think the knowledge that you'll gain from this course has some applicability in some shape, fashion, or form to what you select to do in life. So much so that I would like to change your preconceived notions or perceptions of science to a more positive one. So let's get started and talk to you a little bit about one of the very, very first things that you must know in any geology course and it's called geological principles. And then geologic time, we'll finish up with that. Geologic principles work just like stop signs and street lights and traffic laws across the world. Even as a small child, my parents were really big into traveling, so we traveled abroad. We had some missionary friends in South America. So by the time I was three, I made my first international trip and I've been traveling ever since. And one of the things I can remember about even for that far back was in populated areas, there were traffic lights and stop signs, yield signs. But in non-populated areas, you might not find that. And this has been true with my travels all over the world, regardless of if they were in an English language or a language I couldn't read. Point being was yellow, green, and red lights had a significance, and so did stop signs and yield signs. So when you think about a red stop sign or a red light, you know, hey, that means, yep, I got to stop. Well, what are you stopping for? You're stopping for that traffic, right? It's a law. You're going to do that. You know you're supposed to do it even if nobody's watching. And you also know that when it's green, it's time to put the pedal to the metal and go. You've all experienced that one person who sat at a light, probably texting or daydreaming or hopefully not sleeping, and they never go. And you're like, oh, go, I want to get my to my destination. And we've all experienced that light change, that magical moment when it turns from green to yellow. And you're like, hmm. Some people will say, okay, we're going to yield to oncoming traffic and be cautious and stop. And there's a whole other population that says, nope, we're going to put the pedal to the metal and we're going to go woo right through that traffic signal and take a risk on having a crash. So how does that apply to geology? Like, that's so silly. Well, it has direct applicability. So regardless of what country I've been to, these traffic lights, these stop signs and yield signs, they all have similar meaning. So green doesn't mean stop in Iceland. It means go. I can't speak Icelandic, but I've been there and I've driven the country and I know that that's what those signs mean. I've been to Australia and even though they drive on the opposite side of the road from here, their road signs and signals mean the same thing. So geologic principles work the same way. They're universal. So you talk to someone that's Icelandic, someone that's an Aussie, then you talk to someone that may be from Japan or maybe someone from Korea or someone from Antarctica or someone from Czechoslovakia. It, you know, it doesn't matter. Maybe you talk to someone from Mongolia. Maybe you talk to someone from China. Maybe you talk to someone from Portugal or you talk to someone from... Canada or Hawaii and let's say you're speaking in a native tongue other than the one that you grew up with these geology principles if you're talking to another geologist they're universal they'll all understand what they mean and they're all applied the same way across the board with rock layers rocks fossils minerals and geology everywhere on the planet so kind of an important step, a fundamental piece that if you don't have this, you kind of can't interpret the rest of the course. 
So geologic principles, there are about seven of them, that are the basic fundamental laws that govern how we interpret rocks, fossils, minerals, geologic features, and so forth. So there's some assumptions that we put with nature and what we're seeing. For example, you see Sedona in this picture right here. There's a couple of really cool hikes, more than a few. There's a, just lots of great hiking in Sedona area. That's just about 30 miles south of Flagstaff, Arizona. And this is on one of those areas. There's a kind of side-by-side -side trailhead that you can go to Bell Rock or you can go to Cathedral Rock. And this is one of those hikes. And so you get there and you're up there and you're looking out. So these rock layers here and here are the same. Out here, this is the same geologic formation. Why is that significant and important? Because how we interpret it are based on those laws that I'm talking about. So let's get started and share with you what those fundamental laws are and get you moving on down the road. So there is this really important geologist, scientist, he also was in biology, I dipped into a little bit of all the sciences. His name was Nicholas Steno. Well, Nicholas was also a priest, an Italian priest. And we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of years ago, back when it was not a popular thing. Uh, matter of fact, very unpopular to have scientific beliefs that went against what the basic thought process was of the age of the earth. Well, Nicholas Steno said, hey, Man, there's some, the geology out here, I'm just seeing some really important stuff. And he came up with a number of these principles that you'll learn about today. And the first one was the law of superposition. The key part of that word is position. So position basically mean in what position of order are rock layers sequenced and are they older or younger? So if you follow along in your book, you'll see that there are these diagrams and you can follow and find this one right there under the law of superposition in section one. So basically, you need to interpret this one to mean the oldest rock layers are at the bottom and the youngest are at the top. Now there could be some kind of weird situation where rocks get shuffled the layers well and long after they are made. We'll talk about that when we get to faults and folds later in the semester. The point is, is these principles apply to when rocks were initially deposited and made. Deposited means sediments are actually uh, put down. That's what deposits mean. And they're laid down into a rock layer. So let's think about a five-story parking garage. In order to put the top layer on, you would have had to put the bottom one, which would have been the number one layer. Then two second floor goes on so first floor is older than the second floor third floor goes on it's younger than the second floor but the second floor is younger than the first floor you get the fourth layer of your parking garage in now it's the youngest the third is the next youngest the second is the second oldest and then you get down to the bottom layer it's still the oldest because you never could have put four without having three two and one layers in place then you add in your fifth layer, top layer of your parking garage. Of course it couldn't have gone in before the other layers were there. They would have been put on air. Nothing to support it, nothing to keep it in place. Rocks are the same way, so when we get to somewhere like the Grand Canyon that you see in this picture, shoot man, you're looking at those rocks, you're like, man, that's really cool, there's just a lot of rocks there. Well, yeah, that's the case, but you couldn't have had those rock layers like this one way up here, this cute little layer, this is the Coconino sandstone, and way up here is the Kaibab limestone, which is this layer right here on the north rim. This is the south rim, about 17 miles away. And these layers are the same as these layers over here. My point is this, this layer right here is younger than this layer right here. And these layers are younger than this layer here. And then you get way down here in the gorge, but you really can't see the river from the north rim until you're way down into a uh, trailhead. Those are your oldest rocks. So I'm going to challenge you to start looking at rock layers from the bottom up and read the geologic time scale the same way because the oldest stuff, the, that material is going to be at the bottom. 
and the youngest stuff, the most recently deposited, is always at the top. So that is the law of superposition in a nutshell. So when you look at this, you can see that one was the oldest, and we sequentially added a layer each time. Five is your youngest layer. So the superposition applies as we get into all of these other geologic principles. We keep coming back to that one as a foundational piece. All right, the law of original horizontality. Why is this one so important? So rocks are laid down flat, deposited that is, in a fairly flat fashion. That's what horizontal means. And after they're deposited, hardened, and lithified, that's lithified means hardened, they can be deformed like you see over here. So I took a trip to Glacier National Park and it's actually called Waterton Glacier International Peace Park. And I'm on the Waterton side, which is the Canadian side here, and I'm looking at some massive folding in the Canadian Rockies here. And those layers were flat like this, and now they are all upheaval, they're bent, they're shaped. Well, that happened after the rock was initially made. So any kind of deformation or faulting or things of that happens that changes the shape of rock layers that happened after the rock was made not while it was being made the law of lateral continuity I love this one and I guess it's because I have a passion for for canyons especially the canyon you see in this picture which is Zion National Park in Utah so when you look at Zion here these layers remember the oldest is going to be way down here the youngest is going to be way up here well, all of this matches from here to here. All of this is still the same. It's the same as this. So how does that apply to our diagrams over here? So on the left side of your diagram, you see the law of superposition, one, two, three, four, one being the oldest, four being the youngest. But you see on the right-hand side of the diagram that three and four have a V cut into them. Well, that V was caused by in this case, a river, not always. Sometimes it could be a glacier. Sometimes it could be some wind erosion or some type of a uh, lake that busted. Uh, all kinds of reasons could cause that, but most times it's rivers uh, causing, carving down a canyon. So in the law of lateral continuity, both sides of the canyon wall are the same. The rock layers match. You just have air between them now. They were at one point continuous. That's what continuity means. So there's a second part to the law of lateral continuity. And I'll tell my story when I was a Girl Scout, a fairly young one at that time, earning one of my first merit badges in cooking. So understand, I'm like, you know, 11 or 12 here, and I don't know what the heck I'm doing. And my mom takes me to get all of the groceries and then sets me loose in the kitchen. And to her credit, she didn't stop me from making some really big mistakes. So I get everything mixed up for my super duper double chocolate fudge cake. And I choose like this monster huge pan. So I needed a regular cake size pan. I didn't need like the stuff that you'd put your turkey in at Thanksgiving. But I chose something about that big. And she said, it's your free reign, you choose, you're, you're cooking, this is your merit badge. So I choose that large, <laughs> very large pan, and I start putting in the batter. And in the middle, the batter was really thick, and it started to pinch out until there was none left. And it never reached the other sides of the pan, because I just didn't have enough of the material to work. So that's what lateral continuity means. It either means the canyon walls match because you just have uh, eroded material. It's missing, it's gone, it's been taken away. And or you have where a rock layer just eventually pinches out like my cake mix did. So that's the law of lateral continuity. Cross-cutting relationships. So let's go back to our, our parking garage and then let's think about a parking garage that has fresh new stripes put on it for parking places. Without those stripes, people don't really know how to park and they'll park in any shape, fashion, or form they want to. And you would have to think about this. Those stripes did not exist until the actual parking garage was made or the asphalt concrete surface was put into place. They happen later. In geology, the same thing happens. So you get a cross-cutting relationship such as you get an igneous intrusion. That's what you see here at the bottom of the Colorado River in Grand Canyon. This is a, a dike. It's an igneous intrusive plutonic feature that crosses over rock layers. 
So this rock layer existed, the red one, before this dike igneous structure crossed over it. Another example would be faulting. So if you get rock layers that are all together in sequence of order, like the law of original horizontality and superposition state, then if something cuts over or across them, like a fault, that happened after the rock layers were initially deposited and made. So you can see that happen. We get layers one, two, and three here, one, two, and three, and then four crosses over one, two, and three because it's younger. But is four older or younger than five? So you think about that. If four was crossing five, it would be younger, but it's not. It stops before five was ever there. So what happened was four crossed over one, two, and three, and later on, layer five came into existence. So these are just clues that we see in rocks, in rock layers, and we use them to help interpret what we're seeing outdoors. Because in geology, your lab is outside. It's the great outdoors, and that's what's so fun about this discipline of science. All right, the law of inclusions. So, diamonds are inclusions. Other gemstones are inclusions, but there are lots of different types of inclusions. Just pebbles from another rock can be an inclusion. But let's just say, in this case, let's look at the diagram rock A on the left. It's a dark rock, and then it breaks down, it weathers, and it gets into rock B. Rock B, as in Bravo, could not have parts of Rock A, as in Alpha, and those pieces be younger than the rock. They have to be older because they came from another rock source. So if you see inclusions within a rock, those inclusions by definition must be older than what they are included in. So this is Yosemite National Park in California. And this is exactly what this is. So Yosemite is famous for this type of um, material of inclusions. This second rock is magma that hardened, all this kind of light gray stuff, and then these dark spots are the inclusions. The inclusions were are older than the magma that solidified and crystallized and holding those inclusions. The law of faunal succession. In this particular case, it's important to talk about the term faunal and what it means in this principle. So in biology, there's flora and fauna, and flora refers to plants, and fauna refers to organisms and animals. But in faunal succession, we encompass all of that into one. And so whenever we're talking about fossils, period, we are talking about the law of faunal succession. And there was another scientist, William Smith, who did a lot of mapping of uh, Europe and kind of was the guy who helped spearhead faunal succession, but it's certainly something that James Hutton, uh, who's the father of modern geology, came up with, and also something that Nicholas Sinno recognized. And Nicholas Sinno said, man, these fossils that I'm finding in modern day uh, marine animals look a lot like some of the fossils that I'm seeing in older rock layers. The point being is that Let's start with the bottom. Remember, law of superposition says the oldest is at the bottom. So looking at your diagram here, would trilobites or humans be the oldest? Now, while I've got that labeled, it's pretty obvious. But if those youngest and oldest was removed, you would have to figure that out on your own. So trilobites right over here, they came about around 542-ish million years ago. And they went extinct before ever before a dinosaur was conceptualized. So they lasted for several hundred million years, and there were a whole bunch of them when they first came back, came out, and a bunch of them went extinct, making them really good markers of geologic time. Then I can get into like this placoderm here. It's a really famous fish, uh, the very mean fish that happened during the Devonian period. And then we get dinosaurs. So I would never have a placoderm with dinosaurs, nor would I have a, uh, I might have a placoderm with trilobites because they lived at the same time. But I wouldn't have a dinosaur with mammoth fossils because mammoths existed much, much later in geologic time than our last dinosaur ever lived. And hominids, humans, like a Neanderthal here, you could find them with mammoths, but you're not going to find them with dinosaurs, placoderms, or trilobites because they didn't live at the same time. And so sometimes I get students that ask, well, are you, how can you be sure? And it's a fabulous question. 
We know because there are scientists across the world who are mapping out in the field and digging for fossils to try to get the answers that you're just thinking about right now. Well, what if we did find a dinosaur fossil with a human? Would that change the geologic time scale? Yes, it would. But we'd have to find them worldwide. And I'll give you a funny story. I was, uh, my one of my very first years of teaching, I took a group on a field trip uh, to a location where it was approved to pick up fossils. And it was in Cretaceous age stuff, which is very common throughout all the way from Texas up and through parts of Canada when there was a seaway during the Cretaceous period. So on either side of that seaway is where you would find a lot of dinosaur fossils, but in that seaway you find marine creatures. Even though the sea is gone today, we still have the marine fossils. And they were finding things like shark's teeth and all kinds of ammonites, which are, they look like cinnamon buns, and other fossils that were indicative to Cretaceous age rocks. And this one guy had been wanting to find a trilobite since he started the class. So his, his lab group ordered some off of eBay and planted them where they knew he would be looking when we were digging. And so he finds one and he's like, comes running up to me with his trilobite. And he's like, Professor, man, dude, I, I found it. I found the answer is going to change the entire geologic time scale because I found a trilobite with ammonites. And I'm like, well, you could find a trilobite with ammonites, but not in the Cretaceous period ever. Uh, I could have found ammonites that were Paleozoic in age. And as we begin to work through it, he realized he had been totally snickered by his lab group. And they were just rolling on the ground. They were laughing so hard. But that's kind of the way it works. Until we find fossils worldwide and same age rocks that show and display the same types of fossils, will we make a distinctive change uh, to, to the geologic time scale, and it's not a we thing, it's really some a group called the International Commission on Stratigraphy. They're the ones who set the geologic time scale. So faunal succession also kind of works like muscle cars and different kinds of cars. So my mom was really big into muscle cars, like she had a 66 GTO. Woo, that was a fast, big old engine car, awesome. I learned to drive on that thing, and then I got her 442, another legendary car. And then you think about a Model A, and then you think about a Ferrari. They all come from different time periods, don't they? Well, that's kind of how fossils work. Same thing with musicians. I can say Frank Sinatra, or I could say the Rolling Stones, or I could say Prince, or I could say... Uh, something more modern and Garth Brooks and you guys would know what that means because they represent different icons of music at different periods of time. Well that's kind of how fossils work too and so we can use them to help relatively date rocks. All right the law of uniformitarianism. Gee that is a long word. Uniformitarianism. Well what does that mean? Let's break that word apart. Let's start with the root word uniform. Uniform processes over geologic time. So James Hutton, remember I said he was the father of modern geology and the rock cycle? This was a Scottish farmer, and in his farming he noticed that it took a really long time to get just like a centimeter or an inch of, of topsoil to weather for his crops. And so he began to look at rock formations in Scotland and is famous for like recognizing one of the big unconformities you'll learn about later in the semester called Sikar Point. And uh, he came up with this thought process that the present is the key to the past. So I can remember my mom saying, you should always learn from your past and apply it to your present. So this is backwards of that. And here's why. Because we don't have the ability to time travel back in the old geology days to see how things worked back then. So we have to look at the clues in today's rocks, understand how the processes worked today, and apply those to rocks that were made millions, if not billions, of years ago. So natural processes that are in work today should have operated in a similar manner in geologic past. So let me give you the example that you see here. This is an Elkhorn coral on the left. So I'm a scuba diver. My favorite corals, corals are these. And one reason I like them so much is they're huge. They're big, giant branching things. And uh, you're not going to see them 
much deeper than one atmosphere of pressure. So if you don't know what atmospheric pressures are, I would like you to research that so you kind of have a feel for our understanding how it compounds. So if you choose to dive, you'll understand the importance of decompressing uh, and making that stop as you go, the multiple stops you may need to go up depending on how deep you, you dive. But these poor corals aren't going to do very well in two or three atmospheres of water because the pressure is double every time you go down. It, it compounds. And uh, so since they're fairly fragile, as you get to your second atmosphere of pressure, which will be below 33 feet, then the branching corals get to be smaller and closer to the substrate. And as you start getting past to 100 feet or so, then you're going to see a different type of coral that can exist because the pressure is so great, they just can't have big branches like this one. So I would assume, knowing that Elkhorn coral lives in shallow marine, warm waters, in one atmosphere of depth or less, that if I find their fossils or similar types of fossils in rocks, that that's the kind of environment that they would have lived in. So that is the present is the key to the past in a nutshell. To exemplify the present is the key to the past, I'd like to share with you an adventure I had in Waterton Glacier International Peace Park on the Montana side. I stopped at the visitor center and asked a park ranger for some advice on where it would be some really cool, unknown geology stuff to see while I was there. And boy, did I get a pleasant surprise. He was so excited to share with me what he knew about these really cool fossils that were over a billion years old. And they totally exemplify what we're trying to talk about here and understanding how we connect present to past and past to present. So I am looking at uh, one of the most unusual things in Glacier National Park. These really weird shaped features are not rock layers. Well, I guess in a way they are, but they're not uh, folded rock layers per se. They are squashed up, folded up stromatolites. <laughs> so I'm gonna zoom in and let you take a look at these dudes. Why they're so special? These are the first uh, known fossils of the planet with cyanobacteria back in the uh, Archean. And we can definitively say they started arriving about 3.8 billion years ago. And a couple of things that are important about them. They require shallow marine salty water, very salty and very warm water to live in. Today in Shark Bay and places uh, in the Bahamas where they're known to live, of which I've been to both places to tell you that that's exactly the environment that they are. But you can really get a good view of what they look like in their laminate layers. And what happens is they make alternating layers of mud, which is a byproduct, a waste product, and then they stick on top of that, and then a new group makes their life on top of that old one, and they make mounds in water, and now they're dead, and this is what they look like. So I'm kind of giving you a bird's eye view of what this whole outcrop looks like. This is truly one of the most remarkable things, especially right here in Glacier National Park, considering Glacier's all about a glaciated environment from the last ice age. These are much, much older history. We're talking about pre-Cambrian in age, which is extremely old. To make the connection of Glacier National Park stromatolites, I think it's important for you to see modern day stromatolites. These are stromatolites found in Shark Bay in Hamelin Pool, the absolute most famous stromatolites in the entire world. As you can see, they exist in really, really shallow water, really no more than two or three feet of water. For part of the day, they're exposed. For part of the day, they're submerged. It's part of their living cycle, but it must be shallow enough water to photosynthesize, and it must be salty, marine, shallow water. The point is, is that same depositional environment requirement would have existed back in the Precambrian when the Glacier National Park stromatolites were alive. Instead, you saw them in their fossil format. These, they would have looked like what you're seeing in this picture or these videos right now. So to reemphasize, stromatolites are living fossils, meaning they're the oldest known fossil found in the fossil record, and we start seeing them about 3.8 billion years ago. They still live with us today. 
See you at the next stop. Bye. Now that you've seen how we use the present to apply to the past, when you're looking at rocks, fossils, outcrops, this particular principle is so important for any type of geology experience that you may have. So as we move into geologic time, I just want you to kind of really ponder the importance of seeing the stromatolites in Australia versus what you saw in Glacier National Park in Montana, knowing that that's the kind of environment that existed in Montana a billion years ago. So that billion year marker, it's changed a lot, obviously, if you look in the here and the now where it's a glaciated environment. So just because what we see in the fossil record today, in the rock record, that doesn't necessarily mean that's what we're going to have been in place in that exact area when those rocks were made. And what I mean by fossil record and rock record is the materials that we have on Earth that are rock layers and those rocks that contain fossils. So let's move on into geologic time. So over here, I've got coral reef limestone that contains branching corals, worm burrows, sponges, things that we see in a coral reef environment today. And I see that and I go, hmm, well that probably formed in the same kind of environment this did since it has the same kind of fossils or the same kind of uh, environment and clues. So now that we've kind of looked at the different geologic principles, let's move into time. So geologic time is conceptualized as deep time. So deep time kind of goes back to James Hutton. He was the guy that kind of conceptualized this. And deep time is not what mo most people think of. Most people just think of a 24-hour day. Each hour has 60 minutes, and then every minute has 60 seconds. And so we have a very sequential way that we view time. Deep time is millions and billions of years. So I would really, really, really like to understand what billions feels like in the bank. That's not going to happen. But I can give my best shot in understanding geologic time. The key thing is the Earth is approximately 4.56 billion years old. Now I need you to think about that for a minute. So with that 4.56 billion years, this is the Smithsonian's Museum of Natural History here. And this represents 88% of geologic time. So here's the beginning, right to here. And then this section right here is called the Phanerozoic. So all of this is the Precambrian. This marks the last 12% of geologic time. So most of our history is in this section. Well, if you take historical geology after this course, which I personally think is a much easier course than this one, uh, not as demanding, really cool course because it talks about all the life forms and when plates moved, all that kind of stuff, you're going to learn exactly why and how the divisions work and uh, why we have so much more information here. But to kind of summarize that, I'll explain it here. Since 88% of time is found down here, we don't start getting fossils till right here. And at that, they were single-celled fossils. And then we start getting multicellular in this division here, but we don't start to see an explosion of life until the Cambrian period. So that's why from Cambrian to Quaternary in the Phanerozoic, we have so much more data on. Plus these rocks typically are closer to the surface than ones that are Archean in age. Most all of our Hadean rocks have been recycled via the rock cycle, and you'll learn about that a little uh, later in the semester. So understanding that, we have to divide all this great information and rock layers and fossils and minerals and so forth that we find across the earth, and we have to put them in some kind of orderly fashion so we can interpret them no matter where we are in the world or no matter who we're talking to who's a geologist. So the geologic time scale is set and the ages are set by the International Commission on Stratigraphy. Stratigraphy refers to rock layers. And folks, if you Google geologic timescales, you're going to find, gosh, hundreds of them and different 
people, different genealogists, different manu uh, different publishers come up with these different start and end dates. Well, this is a very consistent one that's used right now. And when I first started taking physical geology, if you find the beginning of the Quaternary up here at 2.6 million years old, the Quaternary actually didn't when I took it, it was 1.8 million years old. So even in 30 years, it's changed to 2.6 million years. And you're like, well, why is that the case? Fossil discoveries. Remember those digs I was talking about? They, uh, scientists have found and mapped glacial moraine deposits. Also, age dating techniques have improved technology. So we have a lot more power and knowledge that's more accurate in helping define how long these different segments of geologic time should be. So we're going to do a brief overview of what each time segment looks like, how they're similar, how they're different, and so you can read the scale intelligently. But know that you will always need to start at the bottom because which principle says the oldest is at the bottom? And I bet you guessed it, the first one we learned about, the law of superposition. So when you are interpreting Always start at the bottom and work your way up. I want you to examine rock layers the same way. Like if you went to the Grand Canyon, I want you to start looking at the bottom, then work your way up to the top instead of and vice versa, top to bottom. So it is very common that people would say the Quaternary is the oldest and this is the youngest, the Hadean. It's just the opposite. So always start down here and work your way up to the youngest. There are five divisions of geologic time. Eons are the biggest of those five. Eons must be at least 500 million years or longer in duration. There are two of them currently on the time scale. There's the Precambrian, and then there's the Phanerozoic. So to be obvious here, if you have your time scale open in your book, you'll see, and I'll go back for a second to this one. If you look at this one, you can see the Cambrian starts at 542 million years ago, and the Precambrian is everything before that. So while that may seem obvious, it is one of the very first things that we have to point out to people is that Precambrian represents all time before the, pre the Cambrian period that starts and begins the Phanerozoic Eon. So the Phanerozoic only represents 12% of geologic time. So if you do 100 minus 12, that means the remaining percentage of geologic time belongs to the Precambrian, which is 88%. So there's some people that call the Precambrian eons, Hadean eon, Archean eon. Uh, each of these are at least half a billion years old, so they would meet the criteria of an eon. But on time scales, they're divided into the era section, just so you know, so it's not confusing. So what are eras? Let's just approach them with the view of being in the Phanerozoic Eon. There are three of them, Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic, so which is the oldest based on your knowledge of superposition. Paleozoic, Mesozoic, or Cenozoic? And if you answer Paleozoic, you are correct. Cenozoic would be the youngest. Paleo means ancient life, Mesozoic means middle life, and Cenozoic means young or recent life. And Eras are divided based on major events, usually large global type events, and then they're subdivided into more specific types of time called periods. So as we look into periods, you can see the Paleozoic starts with the Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian. I'm going to talk about the Mississippian and Pennsylvanian in just a second, and Permian. These one, two, three, four, five, six, seven periods matter because they were different depositional environments. You'll be learning about that real soon. And different plate movements, different types of events, mountain building events all occurring. So, and progression of life also. You might wonder why is Mississippian and Pennsylvanian subdivided out from Carboniferous? Well, it all has to do with depositional environment. Um, so let me define what that is right quick. Depositional environment is the environment that existed when rocks were made in geologic past. So most of the world was in a swamp-like condition during the Carboniferous, especially Europe. They have a lot of coal that was developed from this time period. And so they, they're the ones that kind of coined the term Carboniferous. However, for the beginning of what would constitute the Carboniferous, 
the United States had Bahama-like conditions for tens of millions of years. And we got some really great evidence of it right in the largest vertical section of the Grand Canyon called the Red Wall Limestone. So if you hike that, like rim to rim or just hike to the river and back up, you're going to see a lot of the Red Wall Limestone and you'll be looking at that Mississippian evidence. Well, then we shifted to the same kind of coal environment they had and produced Pennsylvanian uh, period. And of course, these are named after places. Most all of these like Permian, Triassic, Jura, like Jura's, Jura Mountains that are over in Europe. Cretaceous means uh, Creta for chalk. So all of these places are names relate to places or meaning that are significant to that particular period. But periods can be as short as 2.6 million years old, which is the very top period, Quaternary. Or it can be as long as the Cretaceous period of 80 million years. And so they vary in length depending on which period you're looking at and studying. And that's why periods are subdivided into more detailed segments of time called epochs. So if you are from Europe, you might call this an epoch. If you are in the United States, you would likely call this an epoch. So we will use the term epoch. Periods are divided into epochs, and the epochs are much more detailed events. For example, let's look at the Quaternary that's at the top here, where you see the Pleistocene and the Holocene. So Pleistocene started about 2.6 million years ago, and that was the beginning of the last ice age. Then it ended about 10,000 years ago. So why is that that marker of 10,000 years become super important when we get into section 10 and talk about fossils and the fossil record? 10,000 year marker begins the Holocene epoch. Believe it or not, there is a future epoch called the Anthropocene. Anthro referring to humans. So that is another discussion. That's an environmental science discussion. If you want to learn more about that, you can take uh, Environmental Science 1301, and that is something we talk about in climate change. So nevertheless, epics are very detailed. It could be an, um, an extinction event. It could be an ice age. It could be a mountain building event that's very detailed to, uh, to make the need to subdivide out time. Then we get into something called ages. And ages are the most detailed of all of the geologic time frames, and they're also the shortest. So these usually are very specific to a type of name that describes what was going on at that time. And we're not going to be learning about ages in this class, asking you to remember any, nor will we in historical. That's something that you would do in graduate school. But my point is this. That's as detailed as we're going to get in geologic time. Very specific. So in your book, Brad and I kind of used a typical schooling experience to uh, correlate to what it would be like for each of these divisions of time. And I'd ask that you go back and read that because it will help you kind of relate to what each one of those times looks like on something that you have familiarity with and then put it to something so vast as geologic time. So that kind of brings us to looking at and applying what you've learned. Let's kind of apply some principles here. This is Crater Lake. And Crater Lake is a special thing. It is a caldera. Calderas are where ancient volcanoes ejected their magma and gas and ash very quickly and collapsed inside of themselves. Not all calderas are lakes, but this one certainly is. But one thing's for sure, calderas are fairly round, most all in the world, and they're very fairly large features, in most cases kilometers wide, sometimes tens of kilometers wide. So if we know how a caldera forms today, because we've actually seen calderas form in modern time, then we can say that we pretty much know how calderas formed in the past. So that would be the present is the key to the past. So think about the different principles you learned. Was it superposition, original horizontality? Was it cross-cutting relationships, inclusions, final succession, uniformitarianism, that fits what you're learning here. Thoughts?
Well, it's uniformitarianism because the present is the key to the past. So remember, when I'm looking at this caldera in UR2 and I find it elsewhere in the world, we know, based on what we see today, how it must operate it in the past. All right, so you're looking at some rock layers. They should have been originally laid down flat. So that would be the law of original horizontality. We know the oldest layers at the bottom, the law of superposition. However, we have something that has offset these two layers where my yellow arrows are. So that means the layers have moved from their original position. They've not been deformed, they've simply been crossed over by a fault. So would that be the law of superposition, original horizontality, lateral continuity, cross-cutting relationships, inclusions, faunal succession, or uniformitarianism? And so you're likely answering cross-cutting relationships, and that's exactly right. There's a lot going on in this picture, so you can apply many principles to it. And when I'm wanting you to do that with every rock layer that you see, is not just to use one, but use them in conjunction together so you can interpret what you're seeing. All right. So the yellow arrow, arrows towards the top represent the younger rock layers like this one. This is, I'm at the North Rim right here and I'm standing on the Kaibab limestone. That would be the same layer that's way over here at the top, way up there. And then if you come way down here and you hike down, you're gonna be in a whole different set of rock layers. Um, and so which one's older and which one's younger? Would it be younger and older or older and younger, younger and older, older and younger. So you're right that the lower arrow is older and that would be the law of superposition. Now also these rocks exhibit flatness. They were laid down originally flat. So which particular principle would apply to that? And that would be original horizontality. In a couple of these areas, there's some faults. So that would be a cross-cutting relationship. Also in these are fossils, so we could use faunal succession. And also there are, the fossils tell a story about where they were made. For example, these are ocean critters, and then this layer right here that's really pretty uh, cross-bedded one, if you get up there, called the Coconino Sandstone, was cross-bedded. And you'll learn later in the semester that these cross-beds in particular represent a desert environment. So that would be uniformitarianism. All right, this particular place is Bryce Canyon National Park. I love this place. It's in Utah because it has hoodoos, and that's what you're looking at right here, these things with cute little knobs on the top. Those are called hoodoos, specifically cap rocks. Well, the material, the Clairon formation here is the same as it is over here, but there's air between these. There's air between this section of hoodoos and that section of hoodoos, between this one and all of these way over here. So which of the principles deals with matching rock layers and canyons or pinching out of rock layers like my cake when there's no more left to make something. So is it superposition? Is it original horizontality? Is it lateral continuity? Is it cross-cutting relationships? Is it inclusions, faunal succession, or uniformitarianism? The answer would be lateral continuity. Now you could apply other principles here as well because there's a big fault line that runs through this thing, so that would be cross-cutting relationships. Then the oldest layers are at the bottom, the youngest is at the top, that's superposition. They were laid down in original flat manner. Um, there could be some fossils in there, so they're in uh, certainly in the dolomitic type of rocks that are at the top. And so you can use all of those things to help interpret the clues in rocks. Now when you look at this one, these are all fossils, so that's going to narrow the scope of which one of these things we can look at <laughs> that would apply. And you're right, it's faunal succession. So my trilobite existed long before this guy came about, this particular one. This is a crinoid, but these two did live around the same time, meaning there are certain species of trilobites that existed when, uh, when crinoids existed. But neither one of these even were remotely alive anymore. They had gone extinct before our mosasaur over here evolved during the Mesozoic era, during dinosaur time frames in the ocean. He was a marine predator. So that's how faunal succession works. We use them to help us give a relative dating to rock. 
This is Canyonlands National Park, and this is located in Utah. And you can see the rocks are very flat, and they match from one side of canyon to the other. So we got some law of lateral continuity going on for matching rocks on both sides of the canyon. We've got some rock deformation here, so original horizontality. Uh, you can see the deformation has actually caused some of the rocks to be bent. There's a fault that runs through the area, so that's a cross-cutting relationship. There's some fossils in the rock, so I think you're getting the point is that these laws and principles you use together to help understand a holistic view of rock layers. Now this one's pretty specific. Rocks were originally laid down flat and any deformation or changes in shape happened after the rock was made. Well, that's the law of original horizontality. If you want to know where this location is, you can drive on I-35 going towards Oklahoma City. On, then you'll get to Ardmore. This is on either side of I-35 on the interstate. And you can see where the Arbuckle Mountains uh, have been weathered down. The Cambrian to about uh, Ordovician Age rocks, so they're early Paleozoic rocks during a mountain building event where they got shoved up, bent, folded underneath the earth, and this is what's exposed now since it's all worn down and eroded down to these layers. So this is how black sand beaches form. Today, I was in a helicopter when I took these photographs, except here I was on land here. There's, you can kind of see a orange halo here. This is a lava flow that's beginning to cap over. These are called lava tubes, and they keep lava insulated until they reach the ocean and when they do they do this right here they go psh, cooling off that lava turning it into obsidian which is volcanic glass just like that then wave action which you can see right here takes that recently cooled off lava and breaks it into sand grain pieces and globs and stuff and batters it turning it into black sand beaches just like you see right here there's even some black sand beaches happening right along here, freshly deposited stuff. So if I find black sand somewhere else in the world, maybe not modern, maybe it's in old rock layers, I'm going to know how it formed because we can see it formed today. The present is the key to the past. That's uniformitarianism. So as we kind of leave geologic principles, something I want you to think about is how this canyon was made and all the various different principles that are in place. And remember, there's a time scale that these rocks will fit into, and not all of them at once. So like this layer is one age, this layer is one age, this layer is one age, and it gets all the way down to the layer at the bottom, and the bottom is going to be the oldest. The youngest is at the top. There's even some lava deposits up here. This is Oak Creek Canyon Overlook going towards Sedona, Arizona. But the clues are there. And so now that you know a little bit about some of the foundations of geology, I hope that you will consider the importance of looking at all the clues and applying some of the basic fundamental laws of how we view nature. Stay tuned for just a minute because we're going to have our nature moment of the day when you uh, have these after each of your lectures. So I hope you enjoy it. And I'll see you at the next stop in section two. Bye.